pleased today to have as our guest the very, very Reverend Father Patrick O'Grady. Father Patrick is the pastor of St. Peter Apostle Church in Pomona. He's been there since 2007. Before his ministry in California, Father Patrick served our Archdiocese, the Antiochian Archdiocese in Idaho. The two churches, one mission, and uh, that he was a founder of as well. Father Patrick is a specialist in Orthodox liturgics, typicon and Orthodox chant, and the Greek language of the early Roman and Christian eras. The subject today is an important one, it's confession, purification of the soul. So Father Patrick, we welcome you, and perhaps you can lead us in a prayer. I mean, let's take it. O heavenly King, O Comforter, O Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good things, a bestower of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls of the one. Good morning. Kalimeras. Sabah al Her. Sabah al Her. I'm practicing my Arabic. Come on. <laughs> Does everybody have one of the little handouts which can be procured free of charge in the back of the book, in the back of the uh, nave, that looks like this. And perhaps uh, maybe some of you can be like uh, deacons and serve them to the rest of the people, make sure everyone has one in their hands. Okay? The, it's, it's one sheet and it says at the top, the mystery of repentance, confession, restoration to purity. <clears throat> I'm going to follow this as our agenda for this presentation. The only thing that's not on here is the material that I've taken from St. Simeon of Thessaloniki. He was a wonderful saint whose writings are largely hidden because they haven't been translated. He was the last Archbishop of Thessaloniki before the Turkish conquest of that, that second great city of the Roman Empire. Uh, he was Archbishop of Thessaloniki up until the Turkish... Actually, he fell asleep in the Lord just before the Turks took the city, so he never saw the loss of his cathedral in the middle of the 15th century. He wrote extensively about the holy mysteries of the church. And unfortunately, most of the materials never appeared in English and in many other languages for one reason or another. So we're going to start with a little reflection from St. Simeon. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, fulfilled in our stead all of the mysteries of the church. He fulfilled them, and by fulfilling them, he entered into them and experienced them himself in order to infuse the mysteries of the church with the divine energy to save our souls. So in the mystery of confession, there is, in this mystery, a life-bearing medium of divine energy for our salvation, just like all the other mysteries, like baptism, chrism, holy communion, and so on. The mysteries are not mechanical actions. They are literally the touch point, the place, the medium, the nexus, the forum in which we meet the God-man and are changed by him. So what does St. Simeon say about this holy mystery? Christ bear our sins and illnesses. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is nigh. He did not need to repent himself because he is blameless. So he taught and lived repentance for ourself, for our sake, and for our salvation. He ate and drank with sinners. 
He gladly received the harlots. <clears throat> they washed his feet with their tears and anointed him with miron. He did not reject the Canaanitish Greek woman. That's the way he states it. Nor did he reject the woman who was caught in adultery. He welcomed the thief with a word. Peter thrice denied him, but Christ accepted him. Paul, who blasphemed, he called. He demonstrated all of this in the parable of the prodigal son. Christ did not have to repent, but he perfected it nonetheless through his utter lowliness of life. This is a very important point. Christ didn't sin, therefore he did not need to repent of sin, but what he did in the words of St. Paul, he became sin for us. That is to say, he repented in our stead and for us as assuming unto himself all the sin of mankind. He fasted and prayed. He lived perfectly and humbly in a state of continence. He lived on crumbs of bread and little fishes when he could. He had nowhere to lay his head. He did not requite evils, but rather he increased good works. He suffered betrayal from a friend. He was spit upon, beaten, stripped bare, and whipped, condemned, and killed on a cross like a common criminal. He was called a curse in order to loose the curse and to provide the blessing. He even went to Hades with the gifts of repentance. Through repentance, he grants a resurrection and the prize of the new creation. Thus, unbelievers and unclean are converted to chastity, sobriety. This is a very important word for St. Simeon and in the Fathers, uh, chastity, sophrosini. In another part, uh, St. Simeon says, it's not important to think correctly, mitophronin, but rather to think chastely, to sophronin. It's a play on words in Greek. To think or to have a mindset about a thing is phronima, phronin, like to have a mindset. Well, it's not enough to have just any old mindset like, oh, I think like the Bible, I think like the church, so I have like some religious language in me. That's not so phronin. That's just phronin with kind of like special language. But sophronin means a saving phronima. So son fronin, or so fronin, a saving fronima, a redeeming, a converting fronima. So Simeon makes a big point about that, so he always plays on these words to show us it's not enough to think using uh, jargon, right? <clears throat> I just wrote a book on the liturgy uh, that's in uh, for publication, and I have a glossary in the end all these special words about what we use in the liturgy. When you come to church, you know, we have all these words. What do they mean? Well, so I figured somebody's got to tell them, so I made a glossary. That's not enough. Reading all those words and make you a specialty uh, orthodox uh, liturgy language specialist is not enough. It's not enough. So the sophronin, or the chaste way of mind... Unfortunately, this word chastity or chaste, we only think of sex when we hear that word. But in the, in the patristic tradition, chastity is not about sex. It's about everything. It means a way of mind that's completely pure and free of any cynicism or taint or ink. There's no ink. The water is clear. That's sophronin. So unbelievers and unclean are converted to this state of mind and virginity and appear equal to the angels. This is a veiled reference to the calling of the angelic life, the monastic life, uh, which uh, we, we, that would be a whole other Bible study, if you will. So Christ saves by granting the faithful, already baptized, the mystery of confession 
with tears, compunction, mercy, and other good works as they pray to him according to their ability. Uh, there's a story about a, a woman, a very pious woman, who was counseling with, with a, a con- confessor. And she was very upset that she didn't have tears because she thought, you know, how can I, since I know all this truth about the tradition that tears are important, but I don't ever have tears. I confess my sins, but it's dry. Like I, it's like I did this, I did that. Ah, you know, this kind of thing. And the elder said, well, not everybody has tears with liquid. Some of them have tears with oxygen. In other words, they just sigh. So sighing ah, is enough for many people, especially in this corrosive age in which we live now. So many people, their tears are shot through with passion. There's a passionate tear, which is not redeeming. And then there's the tears of a second baptism that comes from a broken heart that redeems. So we have to know the difference between the two. Christ gave the power to loose and bind sins to men. He breathed on them and they and said, Peace be to you. He breathed upon them. Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins ye forgive, they are forgiven them. And whosoever sins you bind, they are bound. This power, <clears throat> this power works through the bishop and priest with the blessing of confession all the way up to the present day and even beyond death. He says that because it's a veiled reference to the funeral absolution that we give at funerals. The uh, absolution, there's the dead body in the church, and the last thing the priest does, or the bishop does, is he says a prayer of absolution over him. That's no small thing that we do at the funeral. That's a little kind of atmosphere to set the stage for my presentation on confession. So we heard about how Christ lived a life of repentance. And in so doing, he was able, through his own experience as man, he was God from all eternity, and he, as uh, the language of Paul in the epistle to the Hebrews, it says, he learned obedience through the things that he experienced in order that he might become the captain of our salvation and lead many sons to glory. The beautiful passage. So this common experience of repentance that our Lord lived bearing our sins in his own body, ultimately on the tree. This is the basis for the mystery of confession. So now in the handout, you'll see on the first, on the one side, you'll see several scriptures that are very, very important for the way I'm going to approach this. First of all, I just cited from uh, the Gospel according to John, which is the um, spiritual authority for confession that exists in the church and its basis from the Lord himself. This is the chief reason why those who have experienced the restoration of baptismal purity, this is the chief element why they venerate the priest. Why do people come up to the bishop or priest and and venerate his hand and treat him with respect. Because it was through this one that our sins were forgiven. Through his hand, Christ, through his mouth, Christ spoke the words. And through his hand on our head, we receive blessed absolution. So it's not about the personality of the bishop or priest. It's about the sacred apostolic uh, charism that was granted to him through holy orders, through the hierotonia, the the laying on of hands. This is very important. So it's not personality. It's power. Apostolic power. So, what is the uh, impetus for confession? What is the uh, movement? Psalm 31 and... Uh, Psalm 31, verses 3 through 5, gives us the interior movement leading to confession. Because I kept silence, my bones are waxed old through my crying all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. I was reduced to misery while the thorn stuck fast within me. 
Mine iniquity have I acknowledged, and my sin have I not hid. I said, I will confess my iniquities before the Lord against myself, and thou forgavest the ungodliness of my heart. So this shows that in order for confession to be real, there must be interior reflection and examination and self-knowledge. Without self-knowledge, confession is superficial. I once had a young lady come to me, a teenager, for confession. I have lots of children and teenagers that come to confession. So we cultivate this early in our, in our parish community. And uh, one of the, the teenager had a list a mile long. I mean, everything you could think about. You know, I argued with my parents. I looked at something on the computer. I stole something from my friend. Um, you know, um, everything, everything, everything. And so after a while, I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is really a lot of stuff. Did you write all this down? She was like a 14-year-old. Did you write all this down? Uh-huh, yeah. Well, like, did anybody help you with this? Yeah, my mom and I sat down. I said, who did most of the writing here? Uh, my mom. I said, I'll tell you what. You know, you might have done all these things, but you're not a baby anymore. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back, slash 90% of this out. Take it out. Tell before the Lord, come back and blame yourself for a few things that you really feel are like biting you. Go back. Just, I'm not asking you to write anything more. Just take a red pen and just slash through it. This doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Give me like three two, three things that are really bothering you and that you want to take responsibility for and name them and then come back and you're going to have a blessed confession. So that's the approach I took. That's what uh, David meant in the psalm when he said, I was reduced to misery whilst the thorn stuck fast in me. What thorn? You know, like uh, you go to the doctor, he's going to say, where does it hurt? Oh, doc, it hurts everywhere. This is not helpful for the doctor. Shall I start removing limbs until we find our problem? I can take a hand off. Does it hurt there? Uh, whatever, right? So <laughs> the doctor's looking for specific, symptomatic detail. It hurts like right here. Well, if I touch there, does it hurt? No, 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 kind of like right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, now I know what organs like there's a problem, and so on. My iniquity have I acknowledged. That means I say to God what God says is the truth about me. That's the name of this sacrament is exomologesis, which means to say the same thing that God says. We say confession. The con part means with. So in order to be a with, there has to be two people involved, right? So I say something, and God says something. And when they line up, we have something really good happening, right? We're going to come back to that in a minute when we talk about many of the practical aspects of confession. In the gospel, the parable of the prodigal, <clears throat> which, by the way, we read in preparation for great Lent, it wasn't always before Great Lent, in the early church, it was actually one of the Sundays of Great Lent. Actually, it was the Sunday of Orthodoxy, that first Sunday of Lent. The prodigal was there, and to this day, it, I don't know if you read the canons on Sunday in the Orthros, do you? If you do, you'll notice that the canons, uh, for that day, there's a canon of the prodigal son on the Sunday of Orthodoxy. So that's where that came from, from the early, before we transferred the Sunday of Orthodoxy to that day. And uh, in the prodigal, this is very beautiful because it prepares us for, you might say, a deep Lenten uh, annual real house cleaning of our soul. It says that the prodigal came to himself and said, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. So he resolved within himself to do this. But it's interesting, it says, he came to himself. In other words, he, was, he woke up. He realized that the beginning of a real life with the Father is going to come from honesty that goes to the depths. 
when he does make the confession to the father, he goes uh, deep and he shows compunction or brokenness of heart by the way he states his, attitude, his relationship to him. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. I am no longer worthy. It's easy for us to say this superficially, but when there's a deep feeling, we feel like, how can I even be before you now? Because I violated you, I took your heritage, I've, you know, I, I dishonored you by my living, and I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. That's called compunction or contrition of heart, brokenness of heart. What uh, David said, a heart that is broken and contrite or compunct, uh, compuncted, <laughs> Uh, God will not despise. <clears throat> John the theologian in his first epistle says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. I've had many people come to me and they, they mean well, and I don't blame them for this. They'll say, Father, I really don't even know where to start. I, I don't really feel like I've got anything to confess. This shows a state of spiritual... Um, a dullness or spiritual insensitivity. It's a kind of leprosy of the soul where you don't have the feeling, the, the nerves aren't working. You can't feel the interior movements of the soul. The person who begins to wake up to himself <clears throat> has a pricking of the heart. That's where the conscience starts talking to us and we start listening and that's called compunction or contrition. Uh, the word in Greek and in Latin have to do with like a, like a poking, a needling that takes place way down deep inside of us where we start waking up to that. And as soon as we find a language to express that com compunction, we are literally on the path to paradise. Compunction is the mother of repentance. Without compunction, repentance is, is like um, superficial. It's like maybe it's in the form of regret. Regret's not good enough. Like I can sin, let's say I, I committed um, uh, a serious sin, maybe I committed adultery or maybe I uh, fornication or I stole something serious, I defrauded my, um, my company and uh, my conscience is really bothering me. And so then I say to myself, oh, I shouldn't have done that. What a stupid thing I've done. That's terrible. That's called regret, and that cannot save you. Compunction of heart goes far deeper. It's a realization that what I did was a violation of the commandments of God, and it broke my relationship with him. And then I realize I'm cut off from the life himself, and then I weep from the depths. My heart starts weeping. Then there's always a path home for even the most serious sin once compunction comes about. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm sure this scripture is very familiar. I'm sure all of these are very familiar to you. Um, but it's, I think, worthy if we take them a little deeper, like go a little deeper with them. <clears throat> and then I have a saying from uh, the Holy Hieromartyr and equal to the Apostles, Cosmas of Etolia. He's one of my favorite saints. Um, I suppose one of the reason I, reasons I like him is because I was a, uh, I was a Methodist uh, minister for 10 years, and I loved John Wesley's uh, sermons. I loved them. I read them a lot. That's how I came to Orthodoxy, by the way. And um, uh, Wesley was active at exactly the same time that St. Cosmas was, Indeed, uh, Cosmas has been called the Wesley of the Balkans because he's, he was an itinerant preacher. He went around from one place to another. And everywhere he went, he erected a cross and he preached in the open air, just like Wesley did. And he started schools and he sent people back to church, even though the churches were you know, in a state of ruin in those years in the 18th century. And he fell asleep in the Lord on the year of the foundation of our republic, uh, 1776. 
um, as a holy martyr. So there's a lot I like about him, and his writings um, are very instructive. They're good for us Americans because he speaks in a language that doesn't assume any knowledge because the Greek people who were his children and the, the uh, Macedonians and the, you know, the people that lived in the Balkans, they were very ignorant of the basic aspects of Christianity because of their long oppression under the Turkish yoke. So regarding confession, he says this, May God grant us the thought of confession at every hour. Let us confess every day. If we cannot, then at least once a week. If that is not possible, then once a month. If that is not possible, then at least once during every fasting period, once every three months. But on no account, let us not fail to confess every year before the great, uh, during the great fast. So now, Cosmas is breathing in a life of repentance. He was an Athenite monk who went circulating, you know, as a holy man. And people loved him dearly, and he had favor with, most of the time, with the Turkish authorities. Before he went anywhere, he would go to the Turkish authority of that area and say, I'm going to be preaching here and here and here. I'm letting you know I'm here. I have no intention of fomenting any rebellion or anything like that. I'm teaching the Christian faith and the way to God. And most of the time he had support. Indeed, after he was martyred, uh, one of the pashas in one of the areas, not the one who martyred him, uh, found his relics and took his head and uh, put it in a special like reliquary and then presented it back to the church. So it's not always uh, black and white when we look at that history. Okay, that's the opening material of my presentation. So now um, I beg your indulgence, but I'd like to have a timekeeper because we're moving now into practical aspects of confession. But I need a timekeeper because I don't want to violate the time frame that we have for, for this uh, presentation. So um, I think what I'd like to do is move us toward a um, conclusion of the presentation by 11. It's 10.34 now. Um, and then allowing the question and answer time. I, 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 I would like to hope that through by the time we've gotten through this material, there's uh, stimulated some question and answer, uh, I mean, questions on your part that we can, like, give more attention to. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay, can I have somebody just agree? Kevin, will you raise your hand when we get to, like, 10.55? And that way I can bring my presentation to a conclusion, make sure we've uh, done justice for that. Okay. <clears throat> So now let's move on to some practical concerns about confession. I've assembled these from my years as a confessor and from my, um, I, I guess, my adding up within myself how many problems I encounter when people come to confession, what I have to deal with in instructing them. So this is really not based on any uh, like scholarship, but more like my personal experience. I should first of all tell you that not every priest at his ordination becomes a confessor. The usual pattern in our church is when a priest is ordained, we give him time to learn the sacred services, to especially to celebrate the Eucharist enough to where he breathes and lives from the altar. Every clergyman has to live from here. This is, this is his, his second wife, if you will or first wife, depending on whether he's married to uh, a woman or not. And um, uh, the altar, that relationship to the altar is fundamental. After he's had some experience, and if he has the disposition to do so, then the bishop gives him a blessing to hear confessions, and he becomes a pneumaticos, or a spiritual father. Uh, that's symbolized, by the way, in the priestly vestments. You see that little diamond thing that hangs from a priest? That shows that he's a confessor. If he's not wearing one of those, uh, it may be he's not a confessor. Okay. <clears throat> Every bishop, of course, by the fact he's a bishop, uh, can hear confessions because he's a successor to the apostles. He delegates that authority to the priest when he grants them this uh, dignity. 
So the basis of confession is our Lord's authority to forgive sins granted to his apostles in the church and in the gospels. This is very important, as I said before, so we must not look on any priest, cross-eyed, or you know, even if we have personality differences with the priest, we must put that aside when it comes to the holy things. This is a very sacred thing. Um, it's similar to like if we don't treat this right, if we put our hand out and touch the ark uh, with a bad attitude, it hurts us, no matter what we may feel justified in saying. So we have to be very careful and respect every bishop and priest when we have uh, relations with him. This does not mean that the priest may not have his own faults or weaknesses. God knows I'm, in, <laughs> I'm constantly aware of my uh, shortcomings. But it does have to do with uh, respecting this uh, dominical authority that was given to the, the uh, bishop or priest. Next, confession is oral. That means it must be in the hearing of a bishop or priest. This is not the same as confessing to a counselor or even to a, a lay holy person or somebody very respectful. I know many people that take counsel from monastics or senior Christians in their parish or another parish, they get a lot of help from them. This is wonderful and should be encouraged. There's no problem with this at all. But it is not the same. Um, there's a beautiful uh, expression of this. I believe it's in um, uh, Abba Dorotheos of Gaza in his fourth oration on the fear of God. It's either that one or on making known, I think it might be on making known one's faults. There's a proverb um, in, I think in the King James Version, it says, in a multitude of counsel, there is safety. Does anybody, if raise your hand if that sounds familiar to you. In a multitude, okay, well you know what uh, Saint uh, Dorotheo says? He says, it does not say in a multitude of counselors, plural, but rather in a multitude or a fullness or a completion of counsel, singular. And then he goes on to say, this proverb does not mean that we should tell many people our faults, but we should tell one person who has power to do something about it, all of our faults without restraint. That's what he meant by a multitude of counsel. So that's very important. We have to have the freedom of expression, or the parisia, the freedom of expression before a confessor. If we do not, then we need to make arrangements to find another confessor. This is really important. What kind of a confession is it? If I feel like I can't open my heart before the priest and say everything. If I feel like I've got to save face with the priest, or like oh, you know, from here on out, he's going to know that I did this and that. Every time he sees me, he's going to go, you know, what kind of a relationship is that? Forget about it. Just as they say in New York, you know, forget about it. It's not going to happen. There's no real confessing relationship. <clears throat> I had one man come to me, but I was in Idaho still. He came from back east. He was visiting on business. And he said, Father, can I come to confession? I said, sure, no problem. <clears throat> and he told me a very serious sin. Oh, he's really bad. And I said, does anyone else know about this? And he said, no. And I said, well, you know, I can't, you can't dump and run like this. It doesn't work like that. I said, this is a very big sin. Listen, number one, it's good you confessed it. Okay, so you made a good beginning. But this is not the way to go. You have to find someone with whom you can walk on a journey and really get saved from this because there are going to be consequences. What are you going to do? Go home and pretend like it didn't happen now because you confessed to some unknown priest in the uh, boonies in Idaho? It doesn't work like that. So we need a relationship. I've had more than one person say, you know, I'm not comfortable coming to confession to you. I said, fine. We've got wonderful priests all over Southern California. Pick one. Go ahead and, like, go and find somebody. And believe me, 
you're not taking anything from me that I wouldn't gladly give away. I know one down in St. Barnabas Church, Father Wayne, he's just would love to have you. <laughs> Look, it's about openness and freedom. When you can there's nothing sweeter than being able to express your conscience without restraint and say, you know, and tears then will come because you're being very honest. And and the sighs will turn into true second baptism. Remember, the tears are the second baptism, the waters of second baptism. Not tears of regret. Those are passionate and those are, those are searing. You know, the kind of... Um, the second tears, you know that they're dispassionate because they don't create a, a, an emotional um, volcano inside of you. The first kind, the regret, the volcano-type tears where you you weep and sob and like there's this spasm within you, those can happen, but that's not the same. That's not the, the tears of repentance. The tears of repentance are sweet and dispassionate and they don't rack the body. They give peace to the body. Okay. So there's a journey that takes us to get to that. Okay. A confession then, like I said, has to be oral. I have to say it out loud and I have to name it. We'll come to that in a minute. A confession which brings peace must be the product of self-examination. <clears throat> okay. There is another handout. Um, uh, back there is one sheet. Uh, you don't need it this second because I'm afraid if, uh, if I hand it out. I used to be a high school teacher. And if you hand out everything in the beginning of the class, you can only anything done because the kids are looking at what you handed out and they're not listening to you. So I would always hand out things just before or during the thing when I needed them. So you're going to be good, aren't you? And not like get lost in this list of sins, okay? Uh, I can just see you all out there. Oh, yeah, I, this one, mm, uh, that one. Um, it is a list of sins. And we need either a question or answer method and or a conversation with somebody who's very dear to us that can help us face the music. A list of sins like this where we know how to name our sins. Or some other means to stimulate interior reflection and self-examination so we can come to confession with a readiness instead of standing there saying, I can't really remember all the bad stuff I've done, but I'm sure I've done lots of bad stuff, so now please just say the prayer. <laughs> Okay, not very helpful. Confession must be in the form of a personal self-indictment free of qualification or excuses. That means I'm blaming myself. You've heard the common expression, oh, don't be so hard on yourself. We all have faults. Just, you know, forgive yourself and go on. No. In the church, we start with blaming ourselves, then we receive the medicine, and then... Based on our faith, as the priest says at the end, now having confessed your sins, go in peace. So we leave with a reinstatement to the peace which passes all understanding. And there, if we start going back from that point, then it's a, it's a, it's a unbelief. You know, it's a, it's a sin of uh, failure of faith. We must take the absolution and forgiveness seriously at that point. But not before that point. That which incurs any of the following pain of soul indicates sin needing to be confessed. Uh, people frequently will ask, well, how do I know to come to confession? Here's how you know. You have a feeling of guilt that's not assuaged by your prayer to God. You have a feeling of shame which is not assuaged by restoration of a mental or emotional state of calmness. Usually takes a little bit of uh, time to feel that. If the shame endures, or if the sense of guilt before God is just like a block inside, if it's there, then that's a signal that we need confession. Or if it's a feeling of embarrassment that's not assuaged by apology to our neighbor. Guilt, 
shame, and embarrassment are all the same thing inside the soul. It's one thing. It's a wound of soul. But we give different names to them in relation of our soul to ourselves, to God, and to our neighbor. So that wound before God is called guilt. That wound before ourself is called shame. And that same wound before our neighbor is called embarrassment. You know, there you are driving down the road and picking your nose in the car. And then all of a sudden you notice the guy in the lane next to you has been watching. And you feel like, ah. Oh. And then you have this sense of embarrassment. That's a little thing of our, you know, just our humanity that can happen. But embarrassment is my neighbor knows my fault and saw it. My, my sin was uncovered to my neighbor and now I know he or she knows that about me. And that creates embarrassment. Well, if those things can happen and they can go away through prayer or uh, patience or a, an amendment, you know, like, like say I, I say a harsh word to my wife and, uh, you know, we're thrown off for a little bit and I come back later and say, honey, I'm really sorry, I had a tough day, I didn't mean to say that. And she says, I know you didn't. And we hug and everything's fine. I don't have to go to confession. This is little. It, if it's a pattern where it's constantly repeating, well, then that creates a crisis. But little things like that happen all the time. As St. Uh, Peter says, or was it James? No, I think Paul. One of them. <laughs> Love covers a multitude of sins. I think it was Peter. Love covers a multitude of sins. So just love. In other words, we can deal with 95% of the stuff in our life just before God and ourselves by saying, I, I forgive, it's nothing, God forgives me, I forgive, it's all good. And it's, it's okay. If we go to confession with a hyper scrupulosity, like every little thing, the priest eventually is going to say, you know, you don't need to be doing this. Uh, why don't you save it all up? And the that come when, you know, you've got something really sort of needful. The priests don't like to say that because we like to encourage people to come to confession, but there are times when uh, it's maybe worth hearing. Not every little thing needs that kind of attention. So, all of these are one. They show a pain of soul needing therapy, spiritual therapy and confession, Okay. We do not mention anyone else in confession, only ourselves. Now, if it's a sin that requires partnership, you know, like you, you did some sin in complicity with another, either by the nature of the sin, um, idle talk, I'm just looking, um, you could look down through the list and pick one or the other. It's not necessary to bring the other person into it, and you should not do it, because by indicting another person, you compound your sin, you don't decrease it. So leave them out of it, and just say, I did this. This is against the Lord have I sinned, okay? And that's enough. Now we come to naming the sin. We have to give a name to it. This is the hard work. For example, I looked at inappropriate things on the Internet, that's not confession. What does this mean? It just leaves it up to the imagination. It's not owning the sin. How about, I defiled my eyes with pornography? That's naming a sin. Okay. That's why I gave you this list of sins. You can pick it up on your way out or whatever. Those are names compiled from our confessing uh, tradition. So one of the monks put this together uh, some time ago, and I've used it for years now. Okay. It's best to have a spiritual conversation with your father confessor, not just drop a bomb and run. I mean, you can do that. It's probably a good beginning for many people. But if you're not used to confession, I would say make an appointment with the father confessor get a little time and sit down and say, I really need to unload and talk about the problems. Let the priest help draw out the thorn that's bothering you. Let him, let him get in there as a spiritual therapist and remove the thorn so that you can have freedom. Then when you come to confession, it's short and brief, self-indicting, naming and precise. And that's the end of it. 
When I make confession, I go to my spiritual father, I have a conversation with him, and then when I go to confession, it's over, very brief. It's very, very brief. I'm not standing there forever. It's very brief because I just name it and we're done because we've already talked about it we have a clarity. It's not always possible to have a full conversation, but you should have one every once in a while. You can go to confession after Vespers or whatever your practice is here in this church or for whatever church you go to, um, according to the priest's pattern, fine. But once in a while, every once in a while, have the conversation so you're, you're open and clear about everything. Confession without communion is better than communion without confession. Confession without communion is better than communion without confession. Remember the repentant thief at Christ's right side. He never received Holy Communion and he was saved by his good confession. Okay. Expect to receive a penance for your confession. I don't really like the word penance, but we don't have a better one in English that suits. Um, I, I, from time to time I'll use the word therapy. Accept the therapy that's given to you in, repent, uh, for, in confession. Priests who do not give penances are like doctors who do not prescribe diets, pharmaceuticals, exercises, or other regimens toward renewed health. We need to do something. We need to amend our life. We need some direction as to where we're going to go after we leave the confession, especially if it's a kind of a sin that's rooted in habit and a way of life. We need like a, a, a plan. For example, uh, a common um, um, a common uh, penance for uh, sexual satisfaction, selfish sexual satisfaction, which is a, a sign of egocentrism, like I'm living for myself and looking for pleasure for myself, is to make prostrations and increase one's fasting because that attacks the very thing that we're indulging. In other words, the therapy is usually a, something we do in the vein of reversing the very passion that we were indulging. So the, the stingy person becomes charitable. The self-indulgent person becomes um, self-denying, and so on. The priest can help with that. Okay. Did I get to the end of that? We're ready for questions and answers. I'm very proud of myself. It's 1054. You didn't have to raise your hand. Yes. Please tell me your name. Uh, Elias. 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 You mean the penance? Yeah. Performing the penance. Um, it's conditional in the sense of our um, experience. For example, if I stole something and the priest says, well, you have to return that, and here are the conditions that you should do that in to make sure that you've restored the loss of property from the person you stole from. If you never practice that, then the forgiveness that was given for you never enters your experience. Your conscience still remains burdened. It isn't that Christ says, oh, okay, I'm not forgiving you now because you didn't do what I told you. You just simply can't receive it because you failed to do your part. Everything is done by synergy. I act, and God acts, and I act. What is God's action? It's the sending down of grace, the divine energy. What is my action? It's repentance. Repentance is action. It's not just a feeling. So I have to do something about it. Well, that, those two energies are synergy. And that's where the spark happens that changes my life. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. And even though I know you, you have to tell everybody your name. Stand up. Jacqueline. Jacqueline, please stand up.
So, Father, can you explain what happens when you um, commit and then confess particularly grievous sins that don't necessarily have um, an easy penance like what you described for stealing? So what happens when you confess but you don't necessarily, you're still plagued over the years um, because of those types of sins? Okay. Um, St. John tells us that, uh, did everybody hear the question sufficiently? Okay. St. John uh, tells us that there are sins that lead to death. Uh, There are sins that don't lead to death and there are others that lead to death. Um, uh, Mortal sins in the Roman condition, uh, the Latin uh, mortal sins. But this is in the Bible. It's in the Bible. There are some sins that are very serious and they violate, uh, they injure our soul very profoundly. And there is a tradition in the church, um, actually there's a book called um, The Sacred Canons that collects all of the canons of the church. These are rulings from the various synods and bishops and local and ecumenical synods over the centuries, the early centuries of the church and the practices of the church. And uh, the, many of the canons having to do with sinning, serious sins that break us from communion with God are gathered into a separate kind of like book we call the Examologitarion, or the confessing book, or the book of uh, penances. Um, it's very, um, I think every priest and deacon ought to, read, ought to read that book just so that they know the tradition. I do not recommend it to the laity because it'll, it'll, uh, it'll really confuse you. Um, so I would spare you from confusion. Um, basically, it's a look in the back um, cabinet that's locked up in the pharmacy. You know, they lock up because it's got heavy medicines in it. And they don't let anybody just get into there easy. Okay? Some sins create a crisis that is not easily resolved, and it takes a long time to undo them. St. Basil, the, uh, the great, the holy father, the ecumenical teacher of the church, he said that we have canons that keep a person from receiving Holy Communion for certain very serious sins for many, many years. But if we see that tears are coming, the tears of true compunction, then we can restore such a person to communion without observing the many years that's given in the canons. I guess my point is, If we sin seriously, then we must not come to take communion for a while until we have developed a restoration. In other words, there's a hardness of heart there. That taking communion will actually injure us and not help us. And we have to come back and pray for a while and weep for a while and do prostrations until there is a kind of an interior compunction and softening of heart that leads to tears. That can be the case of very serious sins. I know one case of a person, actually it was a woman who had an abortion, and um, for many years she had an obstacle in her spiritual life that was not revealed. It was like decades. It was not revealed until she had a very good uh, spiritual confession with a hieromonk at a monastery, and the hieromonk said, you know, what you've said is very serious. Have you ever received a penance for that? And she said, no. And he said, are you willing, would you be interested in working on that? And she said, of course, anything. And he said, okay, I'm going to ask you to stay away from communion for a year. And during this time, I want you to pray, beseech God with tears. And he said, first of all, I cannot impose this on you. So I'm asking if you're willing to accept it. Will you accept it? And she, like, started crying right then as she related to me. And she said, well, you're saying it, Father. How can I not accept it? It isn't what I want to hear. And frankly, I I don't like it. But if this is a way leading to salvation, very good. So she came back and told me this. And I said, you know, I'm not sure that was the best advice as your parish priest. But before you went to the monastery, I told you, be careful. If you go to the monastery, you have to be willing to accept what the monastic confessor tells you. Now, I know this confessor, and I trust him very much, so we have a relationship, so it was not anything, you know, violation. He even called me and said, 
I want to make sure this is good. And I said, I will work with her, and you've given her a good, you've exposed something, we'll work with it. Well, after six months, she found tears. And she started really finding her wings unfolding inside of her. And she, she said to me, what should I do? I said, call the hero monk. I'm not going to touch it. Because you and he agreed. And I, it's not for me to touch that. So he said, by all means, restore her to communion. She's got what she needs. And it was, it was like, now it's gone. And that was decades ago. But the heat, that little wound doesn't go away easily. Because it's a very serious sin. It hurts a person. So now I said, how do you feel about that? And a long time afterwards. And she said, it's kind of like when you go to a cemetery and there's a grave and the headstone, but the ivy's now growing all over it and there's flowers and like, I don't even see the death anymore. I just see the flowers. So. Thank God. Yes. Can, can you touch on... Um, Your name, please. My name's Aaron. Aaron. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can touch on confession for children and how parents can best help their children. Yes. Um, you know what? I meant to talk about that. I wonder if my handout... Oh, I didn't actually finish the handout, did I? It's on here. <clears throat> parents have the Christian duty of presenting their children to the priest at the earliest age of conscious awareness of sin. Okay, who is the spiritual, uh, who is the spiritual father and mother of a one-year-old? The father and the mother. Because the one-year-old needs only what the parent, the mother and the father can give them. They're not ready yet for the ministry of the priest other than the bestowal of the sacred mysteries of communion and being in the church and all that. But at some point, <clears throat> the child has an awareness now of conscience. And when the parent senses that the child has this interior awareness of conscience, that's the time to bring the child to the priest and say, you know, Father, my daughter needs to begin coming to Holy Confession. So in a very real sense, if I can borrow, can I borrow you? Okay, are you, have you any Hollywood experience? Can you pretend like it? <laughs> pretend you're a little kid. Pretend you're a little kid. You're a little afraid of this, okay? And so you're the dad. Come and stand with me. And now you're saying, hey, I can see we've got a good one here. Um, and you're saying, Father, I'm bringing my son to confession. And so in a way, you're handing him an off right. to me. You say, now you go back. You say, come on. Okay, now. What we're going to do now, we're just going to go stand in front of the icon of our Lord Jesus. Look how he's giving a blessing. Do you, do you like standing in front of the icon? Yeah. It's sweet, isn't it? So I'm going to show you a little bit how this works. We're going to stand there, and the only thing you have to think about is, what did I do or say that Jesus wouldn't like? Can you think of like one or two things like that? Okay, so then I take you over here, and I said, now you've seen confessions in the church before, right? Okay, so I take, I keep my epitrachelion right here, and I took it, and I put it on, and I said, now see, I put this on your shoulder, now this shows our Lord putting his arm around you. Then you say, like, oh, I hit my brother, or um, I talked back to my parents. Okay, very good. Now kneel down. I'll kneel down with you because you're short and I want to be able to talk to you. And then I take and I put it over your head. Now see, Jesus is laying his hand on your head. And now he's going to say a prayer. So I say the prayer and then I, I give the absolution, the little cross on, on the head. And I said, see how that's like a cross on your head? That's the safest place to be. Okay, young man, you're all set. And then beaming, see, beam. <laughs> bravo, bravo. So the first confession, do you see how long that lasted? That's, I usually, with children, very, very short. Very short. If the child's not old enough to know what's going, I usually say to the parent, you know, give him another year. Not quite. This is, this is fine. I don't mind standing here with him, but he needs to have a little more awareness of, like, to own, like, I did this wrong or that wrong. And for little children, they don't need a lot of conversation because their hearts are not 
they're not uh, mucked up yet. They, I've never heard a children's, child's confession that wasn't very pure. Because they don't have any issues yet. They're not trying to explain anything away. I mean, even the jerky kids, forgive me, but kids that you just like, oh, brother. They come to confession, and they're very, very self-indicting, just naturally. So it's really, really sweet. But it's better not to be long. And um, I always tell the parents, you know, keep it simple and don't badger them. Let them, let them discover this now. You gave them to me. Let me be their pastor. Don't you worry any more about it. You still be the parent. You still guide them. And every once in a while you can say, you know, little guy, you need to kind of like be a little more responsible. Remember what the priest told you? You can lean on that. <laughs> okay. But I'm not going to be telling the parents anything from that point on other than like general advice. Hey, go a little easier on this area. He's a little confused about that. Or, um, you know, he could use a little support getting out of bed in the morning. You know, this kind of thing. Practical matters. Okay. Um, so I said everything about the children that I think I need to say. Any further? Did I, was I clear enough, Aaron? When, when now, I, well, with my family, my kids are 10 and 12. Yeah. 12. Yeah. Emphasizing 12. Because he is, he's a good kid, but he's just growing up. And, yeah. Um, I just want to know how to help him the best that I can. Yeah. Um, well, of course, you parents need to be working yourself out of a job. You know that. That means the more you can teach your children to govern themselves, both inwardly and outwardly, the better off you are as a parent. If you are, uh, if you are not giving them room to learn through experience and, uh, of course, obviously under guidance, and then encouraging them to take responsibility for their life in every sim single way, then, then this is going to be a tough thing to go. You'll always be hyper kind of like on top of them. I had one set of parents in my church really, oh gosh, every, the kids really didn't want to come to confession. They were at confession regularly. And, uh, you know, as they grew, I slowly worked with them. I said, you know, you don't like coming doing this, do you? And they said, uh. I said, okay, well, just between you and me and the fence post, just come. Your parents, it makes them feel good. So come, we do something, you go off, you know. And... So I had my little conspiring I was doing with the, in this case, it was a 14-year-old. Um, but on the other hand, I said, no, but every once in a while, I want you to be very, very rigorous with yourself. You know, so we, we developed our own little plan. The parents were happy. The kid was happy. So, so it's okay to just, okay, we're going to confession. Yes. Remember, the priest has a responsibility at that point. Right. Yeah. But not uh, as far as saying, do you want to go to confession? No, no. Uh, the children need guidance from their parents. They need guidance. So when you see your uh, six or seven-year-old like showing signs of real, you know, like uh, readiness, bring them to the priest, and let the priest exercise his pastoral responsibility appropriate to your son or daughter. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Father. My name is Teresa. Teresa. And as um, we go to confession regularly, okay. you recommended that we have also occasional conversations with our spiritual father. And um, I'm assuming um, that part of that is to help to um, ascertain and, and name the, the sins. Yeah. Um, so, but, it is, but is it okay during confession to have that conversation with your spiritual father or is it better to have had a more casual conversation at a different time with him um, and then just do the confession part during Sure. Confession? Well, priests differ. Their personalities differ and they, they have different um, approaches. I'm sure Father Wayne's approach is somewhat different than mine just because we're all different. And uh, I particularly like to sit with the person who's coming to me somewhere in the nave, away from the, the, 
the spot where I'm going to confess. We sit maybe in the back of the nave, and I face them. We have a conversation. I usually will ask basic questions like, is there any change in your life since I last saw you? Like, is your health good? Is there anything I need to know about your life? Did you change anything? Is, is you know, like anything that's really bothering you need to talk about? And we just let that unfold a little bit and, um, and then go to confession. One person came to me, I think it was a teenager. Yeah, it was a teenager, a 17 year old. They said, you know, I really don't want to have a talk. I said, okay, there's no requirement you have a talk. Oh, I thought you had to have a talk with you. And I was scared to death that I'd like, what am I going to talk about? I said, no, no, honey, it's okay. You ready to make your confession? Yes, okay, well, let's go. So she was like delighted. She didn't want to talk about anything. She just wanted to get some things off her heart. You know, so it isn't always one way or the other, you know. We have to just be sensitive to it. Look, if we have a relationship with a father confessor over time, that relationship becomes part of the fabric of the confession. Like, Father, as you well know, <laughs> this, per this particular area in my life is a problem. I'm still having problems with it. And, you know, maybe we're working on, like, kind of going into a bottleneck of finding a way forward from that, you know. So confession with the conversation helps further that process. <clears throat> Hello, Father, my name is uh, Robert. Robert. I have a question regarding uh, those that are trying to enter the Orthodox Church that are still catechumen. Yes. And what are your guidelines on confession yes. and life confession? Um, I, I, I've been struggling with uh, getting to really go deep into my life confession Yes. And I've also realized that God has shown, uh, come to light, newer sins that of, of more recent uh, to yeah. life confession. So do do we do we make an appointment with the priest to to first confess those recent sins and then do a life confession, <clears throat> or do you lump it all together? What what are, what, are, what is the yeah. order of operations of sorts? To yes. On this, um, uh, there are many um, questions that go into feeding toward a right answer, Robert, to what you said. Uh, first of all, when we receive converts from other backgrounds, whether pagan or non-Christian or heterodox Christian, whatever the background is, there has to be some kind of account of a person's life and a sort of a cleansing, a, like clearing of the table, all right? This all has to do with conversion through renunciation of former errors, that's part of a conversion for a heterodox Christian. We're renouncing errors. Or for people who are converting from a non-Christian faith, they're, they're making a profession of faith for the first time as a Christian. So it depends. That's all wrapped up into this is what I did. This is the way of life I lived. All of those, that's a huge, you might say, truckload of agenda there inside of my life that has to be dealt with. So we do have this thing called the life confession that's not a canonical term, it's a practical term. In other words, I have to start somewhere. In the early church, they had exorcisms that were repeated over and over again for the catechumens leading up to their baptism. Many exorcisms. We lump them all together now in the baptism service, but those used to be practiced uh, for a long time, like constant like cleansing from demons and so on. And the person who did that would constantly confess their sins. It was like almost like a constant confession, you know, uh, in order to receive all the cleansing that was necessary. So they didn't just make one life confession. They made many, many, many over the course of the fast leading up to the Paschal uh, conversion, you know, and so on. So um, I'll tell you one example I have of somebody who had to make a very profound life confession um, heterodox Christian. This poor lady, though, I mean, she wept and wept in the church. It was during Great Lent. She was, I converted her on Holy and Great Saturday. Um, that's the traditional time for conversion for group baptisms. And um, I had a group that, that year. So she was part of that group. And she, it was a terrible crisis. And she, uh, I had many prayers I had to say over her before she made her confession. Then when she made it, leading up to her confession, it was like, almost like vomiting. You know, it was like spiritual, it was like, it was, it was racking for her, you know. 
And she had to do it several times in order to find peace, like I think three or four times. Uh, for another person, it was really, really simple. And it's like, you know, I, I decked some kid with my fist when I was a 10-year-old and felt bad about it all my life. Um, now I'm finally getting a, like 30-something, you know. And <laughs> wow, great, you know. Um, so it depends on the background and on the person. Look, it's not a rule. It's a therapy. Okay. My name is Roger. Hi, Roger. We and met, uh, the we met question before. I have is, your talk is uh, restoration to purity. Um, as a lot of people coming into orthodoxy have had multiple marriages, so obviously multiple sexual partners, um, confession is, will, will restore the purity of the person. Uh, I'm wondering about, does, is that restoring virginity, or is there, is there such a thing as restored virginity? Yes, there is. Person, and how does that work? Yes, there is. Uh, St. Augustine um, of Hippo says that virginity is not a matter of the body only, but of the soul. So the body is one thing, the soul is another. Now, this is not to demean or diminish the body. I mean, as Orthodox Christians, the body is very serious, and it's a sacred matter what we do in the body. It says that when Christ comes again, he will judge us for everything uh, good or evil that is done in the body. It says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So it's not, it's not unimportant what, what is done in the body. There are ramifications, of course, for uh, sexual dispersion or intimacy of relationship with more than one person. We give something away of ourselves that we don't get back. There's a, there's a, um, um, there's a consequence for that. And that's the reason why we have the commandment not to do that. Um, so um, polygamy um, or marrying many people or being bound with many partners does lead to a diminishing of the soul. That it, it, uh, There's some consequences that are not restored. However, after heartfelt confession and conversion and resolution never to sin in this way again, over time that can, there can be a restoration of interior purity and uh, a virginity of soul. No question about it. But it may take time for that to, to come to fruition. Hello, Ruth. Hello, Father. Uh, it feels, I think that uh, in America, we're very used to relying on our opinions and sometimes, in, in the beginning of the talk, you referred to how we need to offer respect to the priest and to the bishops. And oftentimes, um, we may disagree with something that a priest or a bishop did. Um, so how do we wrestle with that? How do we uh, stay at peace? How do we make those decisions when we do, need to go somewhere else? Yeah. Um, well, look... Uh... The priests and the bishops are human beings like all of us are. They're not infallible. We don't believe in any infallible charism that comes with ordination. It doesn't make them perfect. However, it does give these dedicated men something that is not ordinary and that comes from the age to come. Um, if this were not so, the church would have failed to exist a long time ago and the Mormons are right. Okay? Um, however, they are wrong and the church does exist and the power, uh, the apostolic power of the church resides fully in her and the Catholic fullness has never ceased to be present. With all that, those bishops and priests can have opinions that are faulty and even personality defects um, that give us a problem, you know, that present a problem for us, as I said earlier in my presentation. Uh, so it's a matter of working it out personally with that person, with that bishop or priest. In other words, if it's not something that can be worked out, where we have the freedom of expression, as I said earlier, we have to do what it takes. Then we have to say to the priest, you know, with all due respect, Father, I'm more comfortable going over here. Is this blessed? You know, 
basically saying, if you don't bless it, I don't know what else I'm going to do, you know, because uh, I, can't, I can't work with you, you know. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah. You know, how does, how does the person, um, what can they do inside of themselves with their own opinions? You know, sometimes I feel like we get so stuck in our own opinions. Sure. Okay. Well, we have to be humble. We have to be willing to say, this is my opinion. God's will be done. And not take ourselves too seriously. Okay. Other, right up here, Kevin. And your name? My name is Suzanne, and Suzanne. my question, um, well, I, I'll preface it a little bit. Um, when I first started coming to St. Barnabas, one of the things that I really appreciated in the liturgy is that, you know, we do pray for the president, whether he's a Democrat, whether he's a Republican. And um, I just read something on ancient faith recently, and I don't remember um, who it was because it wasn't one of the people I normally, you know, read. But um, it was a... Um, I was speaking about John the Baptist and how, um, you know, when he reproved Herod, he reproved her for Herodias, but he didn't reprove him for taxing the people too much or, yes. you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I know that when it comes to a moral issue like abortion, um, you know, I believe we should, you know, feel free to get involved and, and that sort of thing. But is there a point... Um, what are your thoughts where it becomes sin to get, um, to really get involved in side issues or in, especially if, you know, if you're someone, you know, you're representing the church, people can see your cross yes. and then you come off either really right wing possibly or very, very yeah. radical. Right. Um, and I know, I realize we shouldn't argue with people or judge them. And, you know, I mean, I grew up with a mother's side of the family that was very conservative Republican, and my father's side was very, you know, uh, you know, Democrats, you know, okay. Roosevelt, all of that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as far as, I mean, I know in our thoughts, like, you know, we, we of course, you know, we shouldn't be judging others, but as far as political involvement, how far do you think we can go on it? Like, if... You know, you believe in more taxes, less taxes. You know, it should go to the military. It should go to social uh, programs. You know, at, at what point is it when we just get so passionate about something sure. that, you know, um, or, is it, or if it becomes like a bad witness um, possibly mm -hmm. to other people? I don't know. If, maybe I'm saying it in a weird way, but right. if you can, I don't know. Okay, first of all, this takes us afield from our theme on confession. Uh, so uh, the temptation is to dive into this particular theme as a separate one, but we don't have the time and the framework for it today. Uh, with, with, with that said, I can only say this one thing, and that is if we find ourselves preoccupied politically by cultural uh, crisis matters and our spirit is disturbed, we have to stop and say, what's going on here? The church does not convert society by preaching and saying you have to change this and you have to change that. It converts it from within. Like the deadness that we see out there with the so-called gay marriage and did you hear that the president just appointed uh, an open gay person as secretary of the army that just came out yesterday. I mean this is shameful. It's shameful for our country that we've gone down this road and um, it's a sign of serious um, um, long-standing cultural problems that are now ripening and bearing the, the fruit of uh, iniquity. You know, so this is very bad. But if I find myself out there always harping on that, then the question I have to ask myself, why am I doing this? And what kind of expression of peace is that? In the end, I have to receive people, at first as an Orthodox Christian, not even talking about my role as a priest and pastor. I have to receive human beings every time, and I have to be able to engage them as human and not pay attention to their sins at first. As St. Jude says, 
uh, saving them from the fire, despising the flesh. Like I, I'm not, I'm I'm not looking at the sin, but I'm saving the person. Now, yes, we have to say things from time to time, but we should be very careful of what we're saying, that we're not cutting ourselves off from saving relationships with people that may be coming to us. Yes, there's no question the church has to have a public word, you might say, like this is where we stand. But when it comes to our relationship with people, we must not allow politics to get in the way. We, in, the, in the end, we have to save everyone. We're there to save them, not to condemn them. Right? Is that enough, maybe, on this? Okay. That is Ruth again, sorry. Um. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> um, in my youth, uh, I, I found myself needing to uh, wean from, away from that idea of kind of a checklist of, you know, you, whether or not you're forgiven from, for a sin or not. Um, and recently I read a quote online, um, but it was sort of isolated, and I wanted to see what you thought about it. It was something about... Um, that going, the action of going to confession teaches us um, how to stand at the great judgment. So it kind of teaches us like how to be, not necessarily like. You understand yes. what I mean? Okay. That's good. So I want to know if that's if, if that's practicing kind of a, for the great judgment. Is that what you mean? Like practicing? Teaching us how to answer. Not necessarily that we've like um, we've got every box checked off. We've confessed every last little jot and tittle, yes. but that we know how to be as a human being before Christ because yes. we've stood at confession all our life. Sure. No, this is good. So we don't want an etch-a-sketch theory of confession. I sin, I sin, I sin, I go to the priest. I'm all clean. It's great. Um, I did have a, uh, a man in his 40s come to me for confession once and uh, you know, it was, it was not that serious, but it was, you know, a way of life that needed to be amended, and it was, there was stuff there. And I said, um, do you plan to, will you accept instruction on how to go forward? He said, no. I came to confess, I'm going to receive absolution, come to communion, and I'm probably going to do this again. That's exactly what he said to me. And I said, well, then I can't, help, I can't help you. He said, what, are you not going to hear my confession? And I said, yep, I'm not going to hear your confession. Because you don't have the right attitude. If you're coming to confession just because it's like etch-a-sketch and you have no intention of doing anything about it, what's the point? You're just self-condemned. It's better that you go seriously, get frustrated, get angry, deal with it, and then... <laughs> make a step forward, then there's hope for you, but under the circumstances, I can't help you. It was a very painful encounter, but there's the truth. So. Look, the day is going to come after we depart from this life, and you will, and I will not have the opportunity to repent. So we should repent while the time is present. Work while there is day, because the night comes when no one can work. So let us be busy about the work of repentance while it is daytime, and we can see what we're doing, because the night comes, and when that comes, there is no opportunity for repentance. We're going to be where we are. If we're in hell now, then we will be in hell in the afterlife. If we're in heaven now, then we will be in heaven in the afterlife. It isn't about where you're going. It's about where you are. So if you're in heaven now and you've received blessed absolution, my brother and sister, you have a crown. Keep that burning inside of you. Keep the flame. Keep that interior vigil lamp, like the lamp. Keep that burning inside of you through constant awareness of Christ and calling on His name. And whenever you have a problem, run to Him, pour forth your your sins to him, run the confession and say, Father, now, I want to confess now. Now is the time for salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Run and do this. Don't walk, run. Because you don't know that you're going to wake up tomorrow. 
Remember Xenia of St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg. Her husband died at a party, unconfessed. He died suddenly. And she spent the rest of her life repenting in his stead because she knew that he died unconfessed and suddenly. So this is a very serious matter. We're all, you know, we're thinking the Etsy sketch model, you know, like, oh, I sinned, I mean, I confessed, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of good, you know, I'm, I'm tanked up. We're not thinking the right way. Let us think with Christian humility and compunction of heart that at any moment, should the Lord come, will we have our lamps filled with the oil? Will it be burning? Will that oil be in our lamp burning? Remember, those who kept virginity, but they didn't have oil. Virginity doesn't save. The oil of repentance is what saves. We really have time for one more question. Okay. Really? Because I think that that was like the best way to wrap up the presentation. I feel like I, I hear only a voice dilute. Don't see a oh, over here, Father. It's Jacqueline. Ah. Well, I'll try Jacqueline, to tie it in. you have to stand up. Oh, okay. Um, so earlier in the topic, you discussed about not mentioning other people's names in your confession. Yes. Um, so how do we handle when we have relational sins, when our sins are either in response to yeah. dear loved one's sins? Like, how do we... How do we handle that? I mean, should we be more like St. Zinnia and just, you know, repent for them and repent for ourselves? Or how can we heal ourselves? Well, if it's obviously a sin by complicity, um, then we have to have the conversation with the priest ahead of time and say, you know, this is a matter that involved a couple of other people. Uh, How do you want to proceed? And let the priest give the guidance. You know, it's like, let's leave names out of it. Look, uh, some of them are it's just you can't help it because they have to do with husband or wife or children or parents or, you know, it's obvious that the other person's there, all right? But we don't talk about them, you know, like a, a constant uh, issues regarding marriage because marriage is a crown. Uh, the reason it's a crown is because there's so a lot of things have to be done, accomplished correctly in order to earn the crown, okay? Um, so there's no shortage of sins that happen in the context of a marriage uh, or because of the relationship, because of the close proximity. Uh, by the way, the same thing in the monastic environment. The monk makes many confessions related to the brother monks or nuns and the elder, or the, the Yerunda or Yerundisa, you know. So there's no question about that involvement and that framework. Um, but we try to... We, we try to blame ourselves as much as we can. We leave the rest out. We don't, why do we need to mention anything? Why do we need to justify ourselves? That's the question we have to ask. What do I, am I needing to do this to make clear, more clear the sin I'm confessing or am I trying to like remove a little bit onto someone else? And that's always a problem when it's that removing it onto someone else. That, that, that spoils the spirit. Okay?